story of civilization. This is the story of Egypt. begins in the legendary Mountains of the Moon in equatorial Africa, thousands of miles to the south of the thirsty land of Egypt. For Egypt is the Nile, and the Nile is Egypt. Here the mighty queen of rivers is born. From many sources the waters gather and flow northward thousands of miles out of Uganda, through the Sudan, and into the parched land of Egypt. Just as the mighty Nile ebbs and flows with the changing seasons, so has the history of the human race risen and fallen along its banks. Before the dawn of recorded history, much of North Africa was a green and verdant land. The sun smiled down. And then came the change. The great glacier in Europe receded to the north. The sun became an angry god. Blistering hot winds swept across the land, killing the vegetation. No longer did the life-giving rain fall from the heavens. Under the whiplash of the sun, the very earth recoiled. For thousands and thousands of years, the sun beat down and blistered the earth, drying up the watercourses, changing a verdant land into a barren wilderness.
early people were nomads and hunters who once lived in a great green land, now dying under the impact of the sun and the wind. Man could no longer live in this sterile land. He and his primitive implements were buried under the shifting sands. The ordeal was for the animals as well as mankind, and they too wandered across the desert in their dumb misery. Here and there a few small pools remained enough to sustain life, but only for a short time. In all this once lovely land, there now remained only a few scattered oases where life could still go on. The nomad and the hunter wandered across the wasteland seeking a better place to live. He joined with others of his kind and fought with them and against them for survival. great valley of the Nile became his homeland, for where its magic waters touched the barren desert lay a green and fertile land. The wanderer became a settled agriculturalist and an artist. He saw beauty about him and worked his impressions into all of the things he made and used. Few records remain of this period, but man laid the foundations of a great civilization. Local governments arose and were eventually unified into two kingdoms, the Upper Egypt of the Nile Valley, the Lower Egypt of the Delta. Narmer, the king of Upper Egypt, conquers the kingdom of the Delta. The falcon brings captive the people of the papyrus swamps. Thus, over 3,000 years before Christ, Narmer becomes the first pharaoh of Egypt, ruler of the two lands. On the edge of the desert, above the Nile at Saqqara, rises the Step Pyramid, the oldest standing stone structure on the face of the earth. And here, the architect, Imhotep, wrought a poem in limestone. A great funerary temple surrounding the pyramid to serve as the eternal home of King Djoser of the Third Dynasty. This earliest use of dressed stone on a large scale is evidence of proud craftsmanship, of a race of artisans who worked with loving care to create a lasting tribute to their gods. Slaves could not have raised this temple, for each stone had to be cut by skilled hands, an exacting task, for no mortar of any kind was used. In these distant times they knew the beauty 
of the play of sunlight and shadow on uncluttered surfaces. And here, over 2,000 years before the golden age of Greece, Imhotep designed the fluted column. Small wonder that the Greeks worshipped Imhotep as a god. Throughout the temple, details suggest earlier primitive construction. A wooden door translated into stone swings forever open on its immovable stone hinge. This exquisite structure was erected 4,700 years ago, at a time when the peoples of Europe dwelt in primitive darkness. graceful form of the papyrus stem, stylized in limestone. Ancient stonemasons did their work to perfection. Each stone individually shaped to fit without the use of mortar. A wall a third of a mile in length with all the beauty which we associate with the best in modern architecture. A false door is the portal of the underworld. The tombs of the nobles depict the life of the times and are not wanting in gaiety. The beliefs of the old kingdom envisioned the hereafter as a continuation of the more pleasant aspects of earthly existence. Pharaoh was surrounded by a glittering court of aristocratic nobles and military leaders. The general Rahotep and his lady gaze across the void of time with the infinite wisdom and calm of the ages. A jeweled collar will brighten the journey into the land of the dead. The swamps of paradise reflect the struggle of nature as on earth. The huge exterior tombs in pyramid form began with the step pyramid at Saqqara and now progress to that of Maidum. The bent pyramid of Dashur is unique in design, a true pyramid for half its height. The upper portion cuts in at a shallower angle. Near Dashur stands the earliest geometrically true pyramid. On the plateau of Giza, we find the full flowering of pyramid tomb construction. And the mightiest of all, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world.
Here, great blocks of stone were used, weighing several tons each. Stones which could not be raised by muscle power alone. The engineering principles of ramps, rollers, and levers were employed in this stupendous architectural feat. The upper courses of stone originally rested almost 500 feet above the base. The mighty works of the fourth dynasty are an indication of a very strong centralized government. Daughter of a king, wife of a king, mother of a king. Queen Hetab Harris was the great lady of the old kingdom. Her tomb furniture made of wood encased with pure gold has the beauty of the gentle curve and the serene straight line. Hetta Paris, mother of Cheops, led a long life of imperial splendor. Fine linen was hung from the bed canopy, suspended from these slender hooks. The Dowager Queen often rode about the palace grounds in her royal carrying chair. Letters of gold spell out the legend. Mother of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, follower of Horus, guide of the ruler, favorite lady whose every word is done for her, daughter of his body, Heta Paris. The origin of the Sphinx, carved out of the living rock, was lost in ancient times. The body was swallowed by the sea of sand, and the huge head was worshipped as the god of dawn, and thought to hold the answer to the mystery of life itself. It was believed that someday the stone lips would part, and this inscrutable monster give the answers to the problems of mankind. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. the body of a lion, the proud head of Kephron, the son of Cheops, and builder of the second pyramid, keeps eternal vigil over the valley of the Nile. Much of the royal sculpture is formal and stylized. But in these portrait heads, we see the true face of ancient Egypt, curiously like the mingled races of our own time. These portraits of nobles were placed in the tombs to assure a permanent home for the ka, or spirit, in case the mummy was destroyed. During the reign of Cheops and his immediate descendants, sculpture in the round reached its peak and was never again surpassed in Egyptian art. Diorite, one of the hardest materials, here holds King Kephron in regal dignity.
Many gods of ancient Egypt manifested themselves in animal form. The hawk god, Horus, was destined to remain a chief deity up to the Christian era. He represented the forces of good against evil. In the fifth dynasty, the governors of the individual provinces began to assume some of Pharaoh's control. Under Pepi I of the sixth dynasty, this process continued. Pepi II began his reign on the lap of his queen mother and ruled for 94 years. Toward the end of his fabulous regime, political disintegration set in. Egyptian fought Egyptian, and the local governors no longer held allegiance to the crown. Egypt became a series of small states struggling against themselves. Thus was brought to a close the great glory of the old kingdom, which had lasted nearly a thousand years. For two centuries, the country was disorganized. In the 11th dynasty, the river was again a unifying factor. The lands along the Nile became one again, and commerce flourished. The gods of Upper and Lower Egypt bind together the lotus and papyrus, symbols of the two lands. Menthuhotep II regained firm control and ushered in the Middle Kingdom. was a rebirth of formal art and tomb decoration of great beauty. On her limestone sarcophagus, Princess Kawit has her hair dressed by an attendant. A polished bronze mirror reflects her vanity. Provisions are made for life in the hereafter. While the cow is milked, the calf is denied, and the mother sheds a formal tear. The eyes of the dead stare into the world of the living. The 12th dynasty continued this period of prosperity and conquest. Sesostris I ruled the two lands in 1960 BC. The names of Egyptian rulers are enclosed in this characteristic oval, the royal cartouche of Sesostris I. Royal jewelry reached a high standard of excellence. Magnificent monuments were erected during his reign, such as this shrine dedicated to the god Amun. Amenemhat III carried out great irrigation projects in the Fayum. The fury of the unchecked waters during inundation had to be controlled. A great reservoir and a complicated series of canals were excavated. No longer was the Nile a fickle monster, but the controlled servant of the people who dwelt along its banks. This grand scale project was carried to fulfillment with this simple type of hole and countless tons of earth were moved in tiny baskets. The nobles decorated the portals and facades of their tombs with sunken relief.
colorful birds of Benny Hassan fly through the heavens in the afterworld as in life. In the ensuing millennia, man will spend his years in struggle and strife. Millions of humans will fall before the wrath of their brethren. The forces of nature will alter the face of the earth, but the wild creatures remain unchanged. The birds of Benny Hassan fly in the skies of today. The artist delicately suggests the hippo's swamp habitat. Wooden bedsteads were frequently inlaid with ivory animals. Perhaps the greatest of the monumental works of this period was the slender granite shaft called the obelisk. In the quarries of Aswan, we wonder at the engineering skill entailed in the removal of huge single pieces of granite from the bedrock. Balls of dolerite or other hard stone were used in the channeling out process. Human hands patiently wielded these primitive tools to reduce to dust the parts of the rock which had to be removed. This giant shaft would have been the tallest of all obelisks, but a fault was discovered in the quarrying process and the project was abandoned. This staggering feat of engineering begun at the quarry continued on in the journey 400 miles down the Nile, reached its climax when the shaft was proudly raised before the gateway of a great temple. Here indeed, art, craft, and ingenuity combined symbolically with the spirit of man as this slender shaft of granite points its slim finger at the heavens. The Middle Kingdom met its end in political disintegration and civil war. From the east, the Hyksos skin with a terrible weapon, the war chariot. For two centuries, Egypt bowed under the yoke of foreign domination. wrested the horse and the chariot from the invader and turned these instruments of terror back against him. To the east, to the south, the war chariots thundered and the force of Egyptian arms was felt far into Asia, deep into Nubia. Oblivious to the follies of men, the mighty Nile continued to bring life and strength to the thirsty land of Egypt. 1,600 years after Narmer first wore the double crown, Pharaoh Akhmosa, with this golden battle axe, began the 18th dynasty. The powerful new kingdom was born. At the capital city of Thebes, the east bank is for the living. Across the river where the sun sets lies the necropolis, the city of the dead. Against a backdrop of brilliant cliffs, splendid temples and tombs enshrine forever the memory of the leaders of the new kingdom. Suit, reaps the full benefit of its dramatic natural setting.
Hatshepsut, though a woman, ruled as pharaoh. An able administrator, she surrounded herself with a group of powerful men who held the country in firm hands. The goddess Hathor, represented as a cow, yields strength to Hatshepsut. Obviously a woman of dynamic qualities, for her the title of queen was not enough. She declared herself king of Egypt, was depicted wearing male attire, and even the false beard of Pharaoh. She was succeeded by Tutmosis III, whose first act was to wipe out the memory of the woman who had so dominated him. Despite this initial pettiness, Tutmosis went on to become a powerful monarch in his own right. He extended the empire by conquests to the south and north to Palestine and Lebanon. This warrior king personally led his armies in 17 different campaigns. In this delicate marble miniature, Tutmosis makes offering to his gods. His personal valor was supplemented by shrewd tactics. He once introduced his troops into a beleaguered city concealed in sacks, as in the story of Ali Baba. The ladies of his court ate from gold service and kept their perfume in decorated vases. A statuette in solid gold represents Tutmosis III in the likeness of the chief god, Amun, an example of the cult of the divinity of kings. Egypt reached a height of opulence and political importance under this mightiest of empire builders. Not long after the warlike era of Tutmosis came a period of peace and prosperity under Amenhotep III. His name will ever be associated with the Colossi of Memnon. Twelve times the height of a man, these huge statues once guarded the entrance to his temple. For 33 centuries, these sentinels of the Theban plain have gazed across the Nile. With sightless eyes, they look to the east, to the land of the dawn, through the glories of Karnak and Luxor. This is the face of the first man in recorded history who believed in one God. Akhenaten was the great rebel. He broke with the traditional religion of many gods and became the first monotheist. There was but one god, Aten, the sun. Aten was a gentle god. His beneficent rays end in life-giving hands. There was revolution in the arts as well. The wall paintings of Akhenaten's palace portray a new kind of realism. These new techniques also found expression in ceramics. Carnelian ring bears an unflattering likeness of the king. 
for he insisted on stark realism in the portrayal of his own person, even though the results were rather grotesque. Breaking sharply with the idealistic portrayal of Egypt's god king, Akhenaten and his queen, Nefertiti. It was their dream that Egypt would follow their ideals, but the world was not yet ready. Titi, a beautiful one has come. But under this idealistic leadership, the neglected empire was crumbling. Revenues dwindled. When Akhenaten died, the cult of Aten died with him, and Egypt reverted to the worship of its multiple gods. By the time of the 18th dynasty, tombs had been despoiled to an alarming extent. The kings no longer desired to be buried in a conspicuous place. Beyond the cliffs which flanked the Theban necropolis lay a wilderness of desert hills. Deep in the valley of the tombs of the kings, they hoped to remain undisturbed throughout eternity. But this was not to be. Of all the pharaohs buried here, only one name is generally known today. Ironically, the young and unimportant king Tutankhamun was the only ruler of this period whose tomb was not plundered in ancient times. King Tut was only 19 when he died. A later and more powerful king was buried just above Tutankhamun. Debris covered the tomb entrance so effectively that it lay hidden for over 3,000 years while every other tomb was desecrated, the young King Tut lay undisturbed among an enormous quantity of funerary equipment. Designed to sustain him in the afterworld with all the pomp and panoply of Pharaoh's court. For an Egyptian monarch ruled as a god king in life and was worshipped as a deity when he died. An ivory fan bears the royal cartouche. In addition to its powerful deities, Egypt had a host of household gods, such as the god Bas, whose function belied his fierceness. Appealing to the vanity of the ladies, his realm included the overlordship of cosmetics. The back of Tutankhamun's golden throne shows the king and queen in an informal domestic scene. A golden dagger and sheath, prototype of blades familiar throughout history. The inner coffin of solid gold, lavishly covered with chaste design and inlaid with semi-precious stones, contained the mummy of Tutankhamun. The magnificence of these trappings of a minor king leads us to wonder what must once have lain in the resting places of the great conquerors and statesmen. As a result of the political and religious tensions created by the Aten Revolution, the power of the ruling house was undermined. The 18th dynasty ended in political and social decay. And the neglected empire lay in ruins. Just at this time, when the new kingdom seemed doomed, the general Horemhab came to the fore. This astute politician 
had managed to remain in favor in a period of conflicting factions and ideas. He cleverly maneuvered himself onto the throne. Pharaoh, Horemheb, the strong man, saved Egypt from certain ruin. His social reforms strengthened the home economy, and his campaigns restored much of the former empire. Horemheb fully restored the power of the traditional religion of Amun with its worship of multiple gods. The mythological trinity of Egypt is built around Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris was a legendary king who was destroyed by a treacherous brother. He was raised up again with the help of his devoted wife, Isis, and avenged by their son, Horus. Anubis, the jackal, was in charge of the funeral rites and the guide of the dead in the hereafter. ceilings of the tombs of the kings were lavishly adorned with religious symbols and figures. Stylized stars decorated the ceilings of some of the tombs. A row of ram-headed sphinxes leads to the great temple of Amun at Karnak, the most extensive ever built by man. This complex of pylons, obelisks, courts, halls, and inner chambers was 2,000 years in construction. Succeeding monarchs from the Middle Kingdom to the dawn of the Christian era here enshrine their beliefs and accomplishments. Standing in the midst of these mighty works is the forest of columns called the Hypostyle Hall. Papyrus and Lotus represent the union of Upper and Lower Egypt. A colossal red granite scarab overlooks the sacred lake. The temple of Karnak, majestic even in ruins, bears silent witness to the faith and skill of those who labor to raise it. While the royal tombs are concerned with religion and the gods, the tombs of the nobles depict with realism the life of the times. 
It is these lowly tillers of the soil who carried the load of empire. In the fields of a huge estate, the harvest is in progress. Wheat is cut with a scythe, transported on a pole, threshed under the hooves of the oxen, and cleaned by winnowing. In the afterworld, the throwing stick brings down fowl on the wing. In this happy hunting ground, game is abundant and the waters well stocked. The noble lord and his lady, who certainly never did so in life, plow the heavenly fields and harvest the wheat and pull the flax. Superb color values remaining in these paintings, over 3,000 years old, are a credit to the technical knowledge of the artist. While Anubis administers to the deceased, the professional mourners prove their grief. A fun-loving race, the Egyptians enjoyed music and the dance. Some ancient cartoonists may have used this papyrus to record fairy tales or fables, or as a Gilbert and Sullivan satire on the behavior of court officials. Life in the hereafter was their most important consideration. A page from the Book of the Dead records the scene of the Last Judgment, while Anubis weighs the heart against the Goddess of Truth. Osiris sits in judgment.
The Temple of Luxor was constructed during the height of the Empire period, over 3,000 years ago. It contains some of the finest examples of colonnade construction and colossal statuary of the New Kingdom. in the shadows of the magnificence of the king stands the queen. Seti I built the Temple of Abydos, close to the legendary grave of the god Osiris. The great delicacy of the white limestone reliefs is outstanding in temple decoration. Additions were made by Seti's son, Ramses II. Here he hunts the wild bull with the assistance of the crown prince. Ramses II was one of the first cowboys. Of all the rulers who ever lived, Ramses II, or as he would rather be called, Ramses the Great, appeared to have the most insatiable hunger for publicity. During his 66 years on the throne, this supreme egotist boasted in stone throughout the length of Egypt. Where he did not build himself, he usurped the works of his predecessors by substituting his own inscription. While still a young man, Ramses led his forces into Syria. Near Kadesh, his dangerously extended army was caught off balance by the hordes of the enemy. The king and a portion of his army were trapped. Ramses and his men, heavily outnumbered, fought valiantly for hours. The timely arrival of the main Egyptian force saved the day, and the Hittites were driven off. Though he returned home with his royal skin intact, the purpose of the campaign, the invasion of Syria, could hardly be called a success. But forever afterwards, the king boasted of the Battle of Kadesh as a tremendous victory, and highly exaggerated versions were carved on temple walls from Nubia to the Delta. At the Ramesseum, he erected the most colossal statue of all time in one huge block of granite. Though an earthquake destroyed this enormous monument, more than enough great structures remain to carry this extraordinary personality across the ages. The vitality of the new kingdom carried through the 20th dynasty and ended 
with the 11th pharaoh to bear the name of Ramses. Then followed a period of decline, and Egypt never again regained its position as a political world power. However, in the 26th dynasty, there was a renaissance in art. An attempt was made to return to the great artistic traditions of the earlier period. The Hippo Goddess was the patron of childbirth and guardian of women and children. The Cat Goddess found a place in the hearts of the populace as goddess of love and joy, of music and the dance. In the late dynastic period, Egyptian art continued traditionally, despite the influence of foreign domination. Then out of the north came Alexander, whom men called the Great. In this ancient land he sheathed his bloody sword and conquered with his mind. Proclaimed born of the sun god, he became a living deity. The Greek god Zeus and the Egyptian Amun merged into Zeus Amun, the all-powerful. Thus began the 300-year reign of the Ptolemies, which ended with Cleopatra. These Greek kings of Egypt adopted the religious practices and the cult of the divinity of kings as shown in all their temples. Perhaps the outstanding beauty of the Ptolemaic temples lay in the enormous unbroken plains of the walls. At Idfu, the great god Horus is enshrined in his own temple. The powerful influence of the hawk god ruled the minds of men for thousands of years. On an island in the Nile in Upper Egypt stands the Temple of Philae. The requirements of a later civilization caused the level of the river to be raised, thus flooding the island. Temple of Philae, still worthy of its ancient name, the Jewel of the Nile. But when we think of ancient Egypt, we look back to the time when Pharaoh wore proudly the double crown, the great days of the new kingdom. At such a time, Ramses II ruled, and far up the river in Nubia, the great temple of Abu Simbel was carved from the living rock. The colossi of Abu Simbel are as gigantic as those of Memnon. But here, the features remain intact and the powerful faces express supreme confidence. Majestic, calm.
Inside the temple, eight more colossal statues of the king form the pillars of the central hall. From across the Nile, this fine cameo, in its perfect setting, sparkles in the waters. But the forces of nature which level mountains play scornfully with the mightiest works of men. Slowly, inexorably, the stone head crumbles. Someday the proud Ramses will be ground into the dust. Someday the relentless sands will reclaim all of the glory of ancient Egypt. What then remains? What legacy survives? What of value to mankind for all the thousands of years of imperial splendor? The true glory will live as long as the spirit of man seeks beauty. For Egypt is a monument, not to the conqueror and the statesman, but to the artist the architect, the painter, the sculptor, whose works will remain in the minds of men when pomp and ceremony are but a whispering echo in the corridors of time.